Without further ado, my first panelist is Sissy Ma. She's the founder of Grow and Sell Your Business. Her superpowers are raising capital, business sales, and she's a remarkably strong contributor to the Shio network generally, and specifically in the area of bringing migrant and Indigenous women into our network. And for that, we will be eternally grateful. That diversity really rocks our socks. The second uh, panelist today is Jenny Wilkes, another remarkable woman that if not for the CEO magic, I might never have met. Jenny is a serial entrepreneur and now an investor in businesses focused on sustainability, specifically in the product space. Her latest achievement is taking Australia's cleaning brand, Our Eco Clean, to the US market. So welcome, Jenny. Thirdly is my decades-old mate, um, Lisa Saganto. Lisa and I met a long time ago, and we've been on this journey for impact of 20 years. Um, and Lisa, there's no one better in Australia to talk impact, measuring impact, and how to get impact invested than Lisa, and I warmly welcome her here today. The final panelist for us today is another newish friend, but golly, is she a powerhouse, Sarah Pearson. Sarah is a scientist, an entrepreneur, an investor, a corporate innovator, and an ecosystem builder. She's currently the Deputy DG of the Department of Innovation in Queensland, but that comes after a long list of commitments to international trade through DFAT, through being an actual scientist that actually um, has brought scientific discoveries to market. So I really welcome Sarah Pearson to join us today. So girls, show your appreciation for the panel. Let's see some emojis. And I see that we're taking a little bit of time to get some people on stage. So, Sissy, let's start with yes. you. Welcome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the welcome. Can you hear me? Are you on mute? I need that sign, right? Are you on mute? Mm, no, I'm not. I should be all right. I can't hear you. Okay. okay. Uh, can you hear me now? You can. Oh, so Christine oh, said we can hear her. So you can't hear me. So, Sissy, why don't you introduce yourself? Apparently it's my problem. So I'm going to sure. take my ear pods okay. out. Let's watch this like yep. on live TV. And I'm going to go <laughs> back to using my speakers. Right. That's fine. No worries. And that Sissy. works sometimes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. And it is my honor. I'm Sissy Ma. It is my honor to be invited to speak on the panel here today. Um, originally from China, I arrived here for uni study in 1991 and had a bank job to go back to in Hong Kong, but fell in love with Australia and decided to stay instead. I'm a FCPA, worked in corporate finance M&A for over 20 years, and now use my knowledge and experience gained in billion dollar transactions to actually help SMEs to raise capital, build scale and sell their businesses. So having been through the migrant journey from uni student to corporate employee, then to entrepreneur um, with English as a second language, I'm especially focused on mentoring Asian women to break bamboo and glass ceilings, which is why I co-founded the APAC Women's Mentoring Circle with 770 plus people from 17 countries now. I've traveled around of people but always find Brisbane to be the place I come home to as both my parents and my uh, my two adult kids live here with me so thank you and I go, go, uh, give it back to Monica you back Monica hey, excellent thank you Sissy I can hear the last of your can't story hear you. Oh, you can't hear me okay okay Sarah let's go to you <laughs> Awesome, thank you. Look, I'd also like to echo what Sissy said and say it's such a privilege to be part of CEO, full stop. It's just such an amazing program. And Monica, you know, well done for all that you've done, you and the team, to bring that here. Um, it's also really fabulous to be part of this panel. So being um, thought of as being one of these women that you love to hear from, Monica. So thanks so much. In terms of the who am I, this was a difficult assignment. <laughs> who am I? Well, I am Sarah. I am a scientist and an innovator, but I'm also a wife, a mother, and recently became a grandmother. 
And I'm really, really proud of the diversity of, of life that I have and that we all have as women. Um, I love having impact. That's what drives me, having an impact. I love having purpose. I can't get out of bed unless there's some sort of purpose. Um, and I really like driving at the forefront of change, driving new ways of doing things for impact and also of discovery. So going places no one's been before and doing things differently. Um, I really, really, really love empowering amazing people to do amazing things that change the world. That's what makes me tick. Um, and I especially like to do that with women. And you know, one of my roles previously for many years has been actually working with people overseas. So in developing countries, I just love working with women in developing countries to empower them and help them to realize their dreams and, and impact. Um, I've got many tribes. I'm quite, you know, got a few facets. <laughs> uh, but at the core, I love people who are curious, people who want to build a better world, people who dream. And I've got a very special place for deep science geeks um, as a physicist myself. Um, in terms of invisible, there's lots of invisible things about me. I'm a bit of a, a bit more of a doer than a beer. But something maybe early on as a young girl, I was very lucky to be told by my grandfather, who I adored, that I could do anything. I was totally oblivious to the fact that I was a man or a woman, a boy or a girl. And I think that's been really fabulous for me as I've gone through my career and um, has a big passion of mine to make sure we have a world where that's, that's the case. Another invisible thing is I've always found the family versus career thing such a, uh, such a challenge, um, that trying to make sure I'm doing both because I want to do everything really, really well. So that's, that's a challenge. Um, and given that I have two beautiful sons and six wonderful, gorgeous stepsons and now a grandson, you can imagine that keeps me quite busy. Um, I feel that I am on the verge of finding my zone, finding my peace, finding my place, which is quite exciting. And um, I think the other last thing I'd like to say is that people might think I'm confident, but I'm not. I'm just very brave. And when I see something needs to be done, and someone needs to lead it, I just get in there uh, and I do it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Glory to the brave women. Love that emoji. That's excellent. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you so much, Sissy. Jen Wilkes, can you share a little bit of your Who Am I? Hey, Monica. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> we've, had, we've had massive issues this morning um, that didn't exist in our previous practice runs, so sorry about that, everyone. Um, I'm Jen. I was born in Melbourne but grew up on the Gold Coast. Uh, I'm of Scottish and German descent. Uh, my dad worked for Qantas and Ansett and became the most endorsed aircraft engineer in Australia's history. Uh, and my mum worked a 60-hour week for an American company while she raised three children in the public school system. So in retirement, they have an accountant a pilot and a specialist doctor at their disposal. So the moral of the story is that the hard work pays off eventually. My greatest achievement is marrying my rock star husband, Neil. Uh, we have been married for 15 years. We don't have any children, but it makes us great auntie and uncle's figures. So for my sister's children, uh, we share our love with our fur kid, um, a whippet, Sierra. She just turned eight last week. And my favourite personal attributes learned from my upbringing are my sense of resilience um, and sense of adventure, um, two things that have stood me very well in life. Uh, my lack of ego, the fact that I don't judge people and that I thrive on change. Uh, my biggest mistake was following what I was good at at school instead of what lit a fire in my belly. Uh, my week... <laughs> My weakness is that I'm driven um, so so much that I can seem cold and disconnected to people who don't know me very well. Uh, my learnings from my career experiences are that the physical health and financial health are very intertwined. You can't have one without the other. Uh, my superpower is my ability to dissect problems and to find solutions, and I give more than I get. Uh, my passion is our oceans, and now all of my endeavours in life are connected to preserving our oceans and our waterways. And that's it from me. I'm looking forward to the to the session. Bravo, Jen. Lisa Saganto, who are you? <laughs> I think I'm Jemima Welch right now. Um, she's my colleague, and <laughs> we've had to swap our computers around. Um, hi, everybody. 
Um, back in time, I was the responsible eldest child of six and I very much looked after my younger brothers. Um, what that told me and my role model was uh, Rosie the Riveter, that US um, uh, woman who came in the US World War and um, could do anything. And I really had that, just like the other women have been saying, you know, this feeling of you can do anything. Um, and I have done anything and, you know, I've, I've managed building sites and I've run engineering businesses and I've sort out big, sorted out big companies. Um, and now I'm setting up a fund. Um, so no problem is too big, really. But the things I've learnt, um, one was about this cognitive dissonance that I had right for the first 20 years of my career where I was helping companies and sorting out companies, but I had this like, you know, it just didn't work inside. And it was because I couldn't see why I was helping companies that didn't have a purpose. So now that I'm helping companies with a purpose, it makes total sense. And um, the other insight was a more recent one of, given all these attributes that we all have and everything else, what I've found is that I've often relied on men of that, you know, I sort of wait and defer to them. And I, I think that they're going to sort of solve the problem and really, and then I get, and then I lose my, I, uh, you know, don't get my expectations um, reached. And then I realise that that actually, it's my problem. You know, we've got to lead. We don't have to depend on men. And I've, for whatever reason, have sort of depended on men to be the safe place in the business that where I've worked. So that's sort of something personal to me right now. These stories are fantastic. Thanks, Mon. I am woman, hear me roll. I want to hear it singing out. Right. Okay. Now, you see, you help hundreds of women raise capital. Can you give us some of the tips that you think are really top level that every woman that's running a business, small, large, independent, should know about? Right. Um, I guess from my, I was actually thinking about helping women to raise capital from that perspective. And also, I guess before you raise capital, you, you can use money, right? You, you can use revenue. Revenue is the best source of, of capital. So you don't actually have to raise capital. You know, finding the right time to raise capital is really important. But in raising capital, there are a number of things that I think would really help. For example, the number one is really just seek out the right communities and advisors and mentors actively working to change the inequity. So like, for example, she, you, so girl, rare birth, she mentors, female founders program. There are so many of them out there. So seek them out and find the right contacts in them to help you. Secondly, seek out female focused government initiatives, angel groups and funds, such as impact investment readiness program. That's the government one, scale investors, female founders fund, golden seas, etc. And thirdly, um, investigate uh, joining accelerators and pitch contacts. For example, She Start, uh, Springboard Enterprises, Women's Startup Lab, Upstart, the Female Founders Pitch Competition, Women Founders Network Fast Pitch, 47 pitches. So uh, there are a lot of them out there as well. Just seek them out. And my fourth point is actually about how female founders actually get you know, when they pitch to VCs. So there is an HBR, a Harvard Business Review study, previously that found the VCs actually ask female founders prevention questions while they ask male founders promotion questions. So female founders need to consciously answer these questions with potential losses, which are prevention questions and risk mitigation, and answer them quickly, but then focus on the more on the outside, upside and the potential gain, because that's where you're really, why you're raising capital for. If you just keep on focusing on the past, that's really not serving you. So that's something that, you know, I think female founders need to look out for in terms of the, uh, the pitching, you know, to VCs. The other one, the number five is about, it's about another HBR study that found that female led ventures were perceived as less viable than male led ventures. And that is a really big problem. This is done without, it's basically blind thinking, the same material, but just different male versus female. And so, but how, however, female founders who emphasize their social impact avoid this, avoided this bias. So, which is really interesting because 
all CEO ventures are social ventures or ventures that will have an impact. So focus on what you can actually add value and you know highlight your social venture, and that will really help you in terms of uh, getting the, the VC funding for that. So that's the five points that I can share. Thank you, Monica. Thank Thank you, Sissy. And I should say for people, for all our wonderful women listening, we're going to put together a digital goodie bag for you. So, you know, if you were kind of running through trying to get all those names that Sissy so wonderfully gave us, we're going to give you something probably in the next week via email if you've registered a good email with us for the conference. If you haven't placed your email somewhere in a chat and one of our beautiful backstage people will harvest it. And we'll give you all the information that all the women are presenting today because we want everyone to leave here really empowered about these sources. So we're very serious about that. Now, Jen Wilkes, you're an interesting person because you are both a very qualified accountant, so you're very good with numbers, um, and you've run and grown your own businesses, but you're also an investor. So I'm really looking for you to give us a great insight into what do you look for um, at, when you're trying to select investments for your business? But um, firstly, it's for me, it's about the product and service. Usually I've experienced it and I've loved it. So um, I see value and I can actually get behind it and actually really, um, really commit to that product or service because I actually feel that it's something that is really special. So um, secondly, um, the passion and commitment of the founder is absolutely probably the number one thing that is going to get them through. So um so that's something that's in the, the fire in the belly <laughs> the gut feel um they um there's lots they can do to improve their confidence sometimes you, you can see it's a confidence issue issue if it's not totally there um or they're too overburdened <laughs> um but you can usually see it so um so that's something that um i look for um and thirdly a strong you know, unique value proposition in the product or service um, and a good market size and fit. Um, that's that's the next round of what we look for. And then um, after that, really, everything else can be added. Um, I think if you've got those top three things, um, the, the rest of it can be brought in and um, down the track and, and with the extra capital um, to make it all work. So that that's it in a nutshell for me. Fantastic, Jen. Thanks very much. Now, Sarah, you're um, an investment panel member on a, on a wonderful VC fund called Main Sequence Ventures. You're also currently sitting in a government job where you're evaluating grant applications and seeing that, and you've worked at the federal government and you've been a recipient of both grant and customer revenues. Can you give us a bit of a, a feel for what, what women can do differently? What can we do better? How can we be more successful in that funding phase? Yes, so thanks for all that. I think the first thing I'm going to say is a bit, um, a bit of a weird thing for me to say, but to remember that we're different. Um, I remember the first time I went to a female incubator in Israel, and I was on the verge of tears the whole time there. I'd never been in a space with so many women founders. And when I was showing their business ideas, it just made it different. Straight in the slap bang in front of my head, it went, oh my goodness, all these amazing ideas that men wouldn't have thought of. I'm not trying to have a division between men and women, but we think differently, we see different gaps, we see different needs, we see different opportunities. So I think as women, we really need to be proud of that, make that shine, so that we know that we're out there with different businesses. Our businesses are unique, so explain that. But also, remember that we're the same. So we can build great businesses. We're leaders, we're scientists, we're innovators, we're commercial success stories, we can sell products and services. And people will believe in those products and services irrespective of our gender. You imagine we don't care whether it's a man or a woman who designed things. I, mean, I, I and you and others obviously do. But most people buy things and don't care. Just we're good at it. So remember that irrespective of gender, we can do this. There's no need to be a man or a woman. I would really um, also add in that ambitious. Be ambitious in your delivery. So Sissy talked about that. You know, When you're presenting, be ambitious. Show your ambition. Engage your passion. Let your knowledge shine. You know your business. You saw the gap. You saw the need. You're driving the business to feel that. Because people invest in people. Yes, they invest in an idea, but it's actually the people. It's people, humans, who relate to other humans and invest in those humans if they feel they can trust and have some sort of a connection that works. 
But lastly, collaborate with everyone who can help you. <laughs> Mentoring people, role modeling, investors, friends, counselors, <laughs> people with all the tissues for you, but just collaborate as much as you can to get your idea to market. Oh. Which is really the whole basis upon which Shio was founded. So thanks for summarizing that, Sarah. Awesome points. The other point I would add to it is women control 70% yeah. of the actual procurement in the world. So let's yeah. not forget, as female founders, we're talking to an audience of women. Yeah. Um, so yeah. very big advantage. Well, wonderful. Good point. Now, Lisa, queen of impact. Um, ever since Larry Fink made his wonderful announcement as the largest investor in the world that the entire world was moving towards impact investment, the space that you've been nurturing and trying to support for the last 10 years is on fire. So can you give us some of the outlines around impact investing? What does it mean? How is it different? Yeah, thank you, Monica. Thanks, everyone, for what they've said. Uh, impact investing is about solving social and environmental problems. That's the goal. That's the purpose of an organisation that is in the impact investing or whatever world you want to call it. And I think women are particularly good at, you know, figuring out what those problems are and then what those solutions are. Um, and then in terms of the returns, what we're expecting is it's not necessarily a trade-off between philanthropy and giving away all your market returns. We can go for impact investment businesses that have really good financial returns. Um, they're great businesses, as been described, as the type of businesses we want, but they are also creating... Uh, positive social and environmental impact and we can measure that and we want to be measuring that and if we want to solve the sustainable development goals we need to be doing these sorts of businesses um this area is growing it's exponential um unfortunately or fortunately because of covid everyone's like re-examining things and saying what do we want our businesses to do so as an investor if you're investing in this, you can say, I want to invest, I want to get great financial returns, and I want to see my environmental impact in this area. Excellent. Thank you, Lisa. Now, the other question that I've got is, I've also noticed an increasing trend of success from women using equity crowdfunding. So have any of our panelists got experience with um, equity crowdfunding and, and can sort of surmise as to why are women doing better with equity crowdfunding? Sarah? Yeah, I think, um, and this is just me making up on the spot, Mon. <laughs> well, I can help you if you want, Sarah. Oh, no. Okay, Lisa. Yeah. Yeah, well, Food Connect is here. Anna Gunter is on the line here and speaking next, so she'll definitely fill us in. But basically, it's enabling people who wouldn't necessarily be able to invest, um, you know, $400, $1,000 into something that they're passionate about. Outland Denim was another example here in Brisbane. And they raised $2 million with very small investors. And surprisingly, for Food Connect and also out in Denim, it's something like 80% and 90% are women because they get it and they want to participate. On the other hand, the, government, the, the businesses really like having ambassadors for their products and their services and they get them engaged in other things as well. Oh. So women out there listening, we should definitely look to is your, is your um, venture potentially an equity crowdfunding veil. And you're absolutely correct. Anna Gunther from Pledge Me will be in the next uh, in the breakout sessions and that they're great questions to go along and ask there. My final question really before we probably need to do, go to the breaks would be to both Sissy and to Jen to talk a little bit about what's the best advice for women that are not comfort, are confident in their numbers? Right. Yeah, I can uh, put forward a little bit. I think Jen has some really nice uh, um, little takeaways that we will uh, send in the in the uh, in the uh, breakout rooms. But I think overall, if you're not comfortable with the numbers, you need to get comfortable with the numbers. <laughs> Sorry about that, but that's the thing. But you don't have to be comfortable with the nth level of detail. But you need to be comfortable with the really high level of detail of the business and get un understand it from you know get the right investor sorry the right advisors to help you if you you're not comfortable yourself and you know like if you are a technical person that doesn't you know don't understand finance at all so get get a really good advisor or mentor to actually you know lead you through those numbers and get it to under get yourself to understand in a way that you can basically become second nature 
and just do it, you know, every time. And like the really high level numbers that needs to be come out every time people ask you, like I have a, a thing called 20 questions. So I'll ask them on 20 questions in a row. And some of them, uh, most of them are actually numbers. They need to come back to numbers. And some of them would be, if they don't know their numbers, they could be inconsistent from the top to the end. But you just need to know of them well so that you actually, you know, you can tell someone who doesn't know their numbers versus someone who knows very easily that way. Right. Thanks, Susie. Jan, have you got anything to add to that? Uh, I totally agree with everything Sissy said there. Uh, it's um, I find that um, a lot of what my experience has been a lot of women are fearful of um, the numbers actually, um, and I think that's an area that we all potentially could help with um, today. And um, I don't think it's anything to be fearful of. Um, but yeah, certainly there's, um, there's things you can do to actually, as Sissy said, to get your head around them and to, and to befriend an accountant. I know most accountants are pretty boring, so, but, um, they, they, they're good to have on your team, but, um, we, um, yeah, we, we under, we under respect our accounting profession, I think a little bit, but, but certainly, um, the, um, the, the slide that I've got to hand out in the, in the goodie bag is actually talking about some of the key numbers I see um, that people need to know. Um, I, I haven't listed all the ones for the sales performance metrics by channel, um, but that, you know, with this ever increasing complexity in the world and your online channels versus your retail channannels versus um, uh, business to business channels, uh, you need to know your numbers across each. Um, and, and, and one of the biggest things is getting your sales price right and knowing how to factor in all the various levels of um, margins for each person in the supply chain. So that's that's I think that um, you know is really basic stuff that everyone needs to get right from the get go. Otherwise, it's you can't sort of turn back the clock on those things. So um, that that would be my my um, my little piece to put to the puzzle. Thank you, Jen. I mean, in my experience is women, uh, often women have a very uh, fear of uh, lack of confidence in a very specific area as it pertains to creating balance sheets or cash flow statements. But actually, my experience with women generally is they know the numbers that run their business quite well. So operationally or how they've constructed or how much flows through a business. So take confidence in that part of your business and then you know release the shame. We're all bad at numbers at some stage. We all had to learn it. And then let's find women through the Shio network or through your existing networks that can help you learn in the way you need to learn and to also use really good tips and templates that help you get there. And I think going back to Sarah's advice, Sarah, just reinforce for us, you know, some of those points you made at the very beginning. Women are pitching up different problems to solve. Yeah, I think to just be really confident that you have good ideas. And they might not be the traditional ideas you've seen, or they might be, but just be really confident in those ideas and stand proud on that. But I would add on the on the numbers, the financial side of things, do a course. There's just you know so many um, facilities out there where you can do some short course and learn about them. I'd absolutely echo the point that you need to get confident with the numbers. Yeah, you don't need to know the detail, 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 but you do need to get confident and, and do a course. Because yeah. I, I used to describe so I was a physics lecturer for, for a number of years. And people were terrified. They're coming to physics lectures thinking, oh, my God, it's physics, it's physics. And I'd start with, so uh, who designed physics? Oh, a human being. Oh, all right, yeah. So who's, who's designed finance and, and uh, all the numbers? Well, human being. We're a human being. It's actually possible. Yeah, it is absolutely. <laughs> you can use it to drive your business in all sorts of different ways and to change it and change business models. That's yeah. fun. And I, I really want to emphasize, you know, one of Sissy's opening points was really a strong point. Um, the best funding you get for your business is from customers. And my experience is women, when they define their customers well, know who they are and know how to build communities around those customer segments, right? So we, we're maybe not as good on the scaling up the numbers, but we know that cohort. And that's the core of, the, of really getting through those early years of the business is growing that relationship with your target client and wherever possible, how do we use their money and their input to the business to grow and make you more successful in how you grow? Right. Now, Lisa, finally to you, um, you talked a little bit about measuring 
in the breakout, I assume you'll take lots of questions because, you know, it's a bit like splitting the atom. How do I measure impact? <laughs> um, I think that I think the answer just along the, in lines with what everyone else has said is you can and it's not that hard and you've got to give it a go. So you make estimates. You know, what's your estimate of how much waste has been um, not gone to the local city dump? Um, how many lives, how many kids have you stopped suiciding? Um, you know, that's the end point. The hard bit is actually working out what are those end measures you want to um, pick. But it's doable. There's no golden answer that is someone sitting on in the world. We can all do it. Yeah. So we can start with a simple drawing and a few numbers and just consistently measure them and then come and work with good people like yourselves to work out how to, how to put that into an investment proposition. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. And we'll take, you through, we'll take you through that in the breakout group. So I can talk. Yeah, we could do another three hours on this, right? And maybe we will in a separate session because I think it's there's just so much to unpack here and so much to give confidence to. But I'm really conscious of time and I really want um, us to get through into the breakout room. So could I ask everyone in the audience to do a big I am woman? Um, cheers to our beautiful panellists today that have just given some great tips. Thank you, Jen Wilkes. Thank you, Sissy Ma. Thank you, Sarah Pearson. And thank you, Lisa Saganto, for joining me.